here we go again, back to basic Bible study. I am your host. I am your facilitator, your teacher um, for the hour, Reverend Corey Evans Sr. You have tuned in to Back to Basics Bible Study. This is our virtual weekly uh, Bible study Zoom line to where God placed it upon our heart to uh, at, the, at the start of the pandemic um, when we all came inside. Uh, God placed it upon our heart to uh, get back to basics, to get back to studying the Bible as he deems necessary for us to study it. And that's that's by studying his word book by book, chapter by chapter, line by line, word by word if necessary, so the people of God can get God's content and his context of what we are reading. We need to understand his plans, his promises for our life as we are reading the Bible, okay? The Bible is simple. It's our basic instructions before leaving this earth. Um, so we are to read his word, but to read his word into proper in proper content and context um, so that we can apply it to our lives. And that is always my prayer that I can uh, teach the Bible or teach Bible study anytime I'm teaching or preaching um, to teach it in a way to where the uh, I can put it in the simplest format to where every age group, every educational level can understand um, what we are preaching and what we're teaching. And that's our intent to make sure that you can connect the dots, to make sure that when you learn the Bible, when you're reading the Bible, that you may not know that I'm giving you uh, in-depth theory or, or systematic theology, but um, you are receiving it in a way to where you can simply understand it, just making things plain, making it plain for you to understand so you can connect the dots, so you can understand the Bible and you can understand how you can apply it to your life, amen? Amen. With that being said, that gives everybody enough time to come on. We are in Nehemiah chapter three. We've matriculated ourselves down to that. We walked our way from Genesis down to Nehemiah. Uh, and if you are viewing later by YouTube, our prayer is that you hit the subscribe, like, share button, uh, hit the notifications bell so you will be prompted every time we post a new video, which is weekly. If you are listening live by our Zoom line, we love you. We thank you. Come on in. Take a seat. Get your Bibles out. Uh, get yourself comfortable. Get your highlighters on so we can uh, go over the Word of God. If you are listening later um, via our radio blog um, line, we um, thank you. We thank God for your presence as well. Uh, make yourself comfortable. Keep on coming back every Wednesday at 12 o'clock noon, our time in the United States, because this is aired all over the world. Okay, so we thank you. And go to our YouTube page, subscribe, like, share, go to Back to Basics Bible Study or, or uh, search my name on YouTube, Corey Evans Sr., and it will come up. Amen. With that being said, let's jump into Nehemiah. Now, remember, Nehemiah is broken down into two parts. A simple outline of Nehemiah is chapters one through seven, then is chapters eight through 13. Chapter one through seven is rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, okay? Rebuilding the walls. Then eight through 13 is revival and reform of the people, okay? And as I said on last session, chapters one through seven is rebuilding physical structures. And eight through 13, you can take it as that Revival and reform is what the outline says. You can take it as that um, one through seven is rebuilding physical structures, but eight through 13 is rebuilding the uh, human nature, the, the rebuilding the, the person instead of the place. Uh, one through seven is rebuilding the place. Eight through 13 is rebuilding the person, uh, reconnecting with God, refocusing uh, on God as you will, Okay. Um, and obeying his laws, his statutes, and his commands. Amen. So let's work ourselves down to uh, chapter three. We went over chapter one, and we went over a summary last week, and we went over chapters one and two. Um, and we know that we were dealing with Nehemiah gaining permission to uh, from the king to go and and somewhat motivate the people and to oversee them building the wall, rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. And we know by our history and our Bible that we understand that with historical data, your, your 
cities in that time were fortified with great walls, just like you see the Great Wall of China now. So you shouldn't doubt the Bible because look at how many people in China and you can see the Great Wall of China, okay? So um, understand that was the norm. Over the around the cities, you had a fortified wall to protect from invaders, okay? And to protect the people that were within the cities. So we know that Nehemiah is our um, major character. And we know in chapters one and two that he has now returned. And remember, this is after the great captivity. This is out of the captivity where the people of God, the chosen ones of Israel, of course, because of their disobedience, because of their disobedience, we can't forget to say that, they were put into captivity once again. And because of that, now God will always show his grace and his mercy. Uh, but he's a just God. He can't give you the blessings for your obedience without giving you the punishment for your disobedience. If he, if he did not do so, he would not be a just God, okay? He would not be just at all. He wouldn't be fair, okay, to only reward you for great things, but not chastise you for the things that you do wrong. And our word declares to us that he, uh, whom he loveth, he chastises. So if you received any type of chastising from God, it's because he loves you. Amen. He loves you and he rewards you for the great things, but he has to chastise you for the things that you do wrong that's against his word, his will, or his way. Amen. So let's look at chapter three. Uh, they are coming back from captivity. They are finding that during the time that they uh, were conquered, that the walls were torn down. Okay. The walls were torn down or greatly damaged. And so they're trying to rebuild that. So if you see in your study Bible, which you should have a study Bible by now, with all of the times that you've heard me teach, I say the same thing, get your study Bible. So your heading of chapter three is rebuilding the wall. That's where we are with Nehemiah. He's returned back. The king has given him permission. He's returned back to Jerusalem to um, spearhead the wall being built. Then um, it says, chapter three, then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brother and the priest and built the sheep gate. Now, let me tell you this. There are numerous gates on the wall. So don't let that throw you off, Okay. There's one main, gate, one main gate, but there's numerous gates that's there for numerous reasons, okay? So don't let that throw you off. Um, next time, I'll see if I can post a picture of what a wall looks like and what the different gates would be, possibly, okay? Uh, what the historical data shows. But anyway, chapter three, we're going to breeze through, because I know you've read it ahead of time. It gives a lot of names, a lot of lineage, and it's just saying the sections or the people that were working on the wall. So chapter three is solely just who's working on the wall and where. So don't get caught up. Remember, it's the rebuilding of the wall. That's what you need to remember, okay? Chapter three, because I'm going to skip through it, but you should have already read it, but it's just the sections of the wall, okay? So keep that in mind. We're trying to get to chapter four, okay? Rebuilding the wall, chapter three. Then Elisha, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priests, and built the sheep gate. That's one particular gate. They consecrated it and hung its doors. Why would the priests build a sheep gate? Because the common sense, right? The sheep were used as sacrifice. So they were they took time to rebuild the sheep gate and consecrated, dedicated them to God because that's where the sacrifices came in, okay? So just keep that in mind. See, if you just think about it like that, everything, you know, the Bible makes perfectly good sense if you take time to think about it like that. They built as far as the Tower of the Hundred and consecrated it, then as far as the Tower of Hananel. Um, next to Elisha, the men of Jericho built, and next to them, Zachor, uh, the son of Amai, built. You see how this is going? Okay. So it's just giving names and who was next to who and who was next to who. We don't have to spend a lot of time on that. Okay. So then it says the fish, look at verse three. I'm going to skip now. Okay. I'm going to skip. 
okay, they built the fish gate. They laid its beams and hung its doors with its bolts and its doors. Okay, then uh, the sons of Koz made repairs. Um, then uh, next to them, Zadok made repairs. Next to them, repairs were made, but their nobles did not put their shoulders to work or their lord, okay? Um, Tekoitis made repairs, okay? All right, then uh, verse six, moreover, Jehadiah, uh, I'm sorry, Jehoiada, Jehoiada um, repaired the old gate. So now we have a different name of a gate. There is numerous gates along the wall, numerous. Okay, so let's skip through it here. Repair, they speak of the old gate in verse six. They laid his beams and hung his doors uh, with his bolts and bars. Um, then it said, um, the men of Gibeon and Mizpah repaired the residence of the governor of the region beyond the river. Um, then next to them, one of the goldsmiths made repairs. Um, one of the perfumers made repairs. And they fortified Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Um, then the leader of half the district of Jerusalem made repairs, made repairs in front of his house, the uh, governor's house. Uh, skip down to 11. Uh, it tells you who made repairs to another section as well as the tower of the ovens. That's another section. Speaking of the towers, and next to him was Shalom, uh, the leader of half district of Jerusalem. He and his daughters made repairs. Verse 13 said, so all it is, is talking about the different sections of the wall and who made repairs. So don't get caught up in this. Okay, let's just flow right through it. Okay, hand on in it. And um, those inhabitants repaired the valley gate. That's another gate, valley gate. They built it, hung its doors with its bolts and bars and repaired a thousand cubits of wall as far as the refuse gate. Okay, that's another gate. Okay, they repaired the refuse gate. Um, he built it and hung his doors and his bolts and bars. You see how many different sections this thing? Then uh, Shalon in verse 15 repaired the fountain gate, built it, covered it, hung his doors and bolts and bars, and repaired the wall of the pool of Selah by the king's garden as far as the stairs that they go down from the city of David. 16, it says, after him, Nehemiah, um, leader of the half district of Bethzer, made repairs as far as the place in front of the tombs of David to the man-made pool as far as the house of the mighty. Okay, you see house of mighty is capitalized. So, you know, that's divine. Okay, verse 17, after him, the Levites. Then it says a leader of the district of that made repairs for his district. And after him, their brethren, and they made repairs. And then uh, the leader of Mizpah repaired another section in front of the accent to the armory at the buttress. That's another section. Um, they repaired another section from the buttress to the door um, of the house of Eliashib, the high priest. Then another door, then 22, after him, the priest made of the plane, made repairs, and it go on and on and on of just the repairs of the doors of the different sections. 26 speaks of another section. It speaks of the water gate toward the east um, and one of the towers. Uh, one of the great pro, uh, projecting towers, it spoke of that. Then it spoke of the horse gate. You see how many different gates was on this wall? This wall was huge. It was immense, okay? Spoke of a horse gate and the priest made repairs, each in front of his own house. Uh, and after them, Zadok in 29 uh, made repairs in front of his own house. And, uh, and it goes on and on. It speaks of the east gate. It speaks of repairing another section, uh, speaks of the goldsmiths working, uh, and between the up 32 and between the upper room at the corner, as far as the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and the merchants made repairs. <laughs> I just tried to go through chapter three, and believe me, it's important, but for your understanding, just know there were multiple sections of this gate that needed to be repaired when they were conquered, when they were taken into captivity, 
the children of Israel were. Then their city was destroyed. The gate was, the wall was destroyed. Thus all the gates, most of the gates were destroyed. Okay. So with them returning back to the city, okay, they were in captivity with them were exiling back, just like they exile out of Egypt. They're exiling from captivity on multiple different, not just one, but different waves back to Jerusalem. They had God made a way and allowed them to find favor with the king so that they can go back and start to rebuild the wall, thus rebuilding the city and have people living there. Okay. So the people could be protected. That's what you need to remember. You don't need to remember each and every person that rebuilt a particular section, okay? Don't major in the minors, as I like to say, <laughs> okay? Major in the majors. Don't major in the minors. You spend too much time in the minors, you'll never make it to the majors. That's a baseball term. My son know what I'm talking about, okay? Now, chapter four, the wall defended against enemies. Now, keep in mind, who would have a problem with this gate being repaired, I mean, with the wall and its gates being repaired. Let's use common sense. All of the nations that were against the children of Israel would have a problem with the people returning to the city, for one, the city being rebuilt, and the wall being rebuilt because then they can defend themselves. Okay? So they would have a problem with that. So you have to understand who would come against them. So we're going to see two different things. We're going to see um, the enemies coming against them and not wanting the wall to be built. And we're going to actually see turmoil coming against them from within. Okay. So keep that in mind. I went over that in the summary last week. So let's get into chapter four real quick. Okay. Chapter four. But it so happened when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall. Now, let me say this. Nehemiah is different because he is speaking from a speaker's voice, just like I am speaking to you, okay? Uh, I believe that's in English, the first person, I believe. Um, I haven't taken English a very long time, and I think that's the first person narrative, I believe it is. Um, put in the comments. If I'm wrong, I can't remember. Um, but so when he says, I, that's Nehemiah speaking. Okay. When he says, we, Nehemiah is speaking, telling the story himself. Okay. So chapter four, but it so happened when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, the children of Jerusalem, that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, why are these feeble Jews, I mean, what are these feeble Jews doing? Okay, the nation just came out of captivity, so they were feeble. But you got to understand this. <laughs> oh my God, thank you, Holy Spirit. You got to understand, um, his strength is made perfect in our weakness. Come on, Bible readers. So they were looking at a nation coming out of captivity, but they were not looking at who brought them out of captivity. I'm about to get happy on, on, on the first section. I'm sorry. Let me calm down. Okay. They said, what these feeble Jews doing? But we serve a mighty God. Come on, somebody. So what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Question mark. Will they offer sacrifices? Question mark. Will they complete it in a day? Question mark. All this sarcasm. Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish? Because they tore down the walls and the gates. Um, will they revive the stone from the heaps of rubbish, the stones that are, are burned? Oh, we made sure to tear that wall down. We made sure to tear down the gates. We can go in and out that city anytime we want to and conquer those feeble people. Huh. But let's see what God has to say about it. He has the final say. He fights our battles for us. We don't have to fight in and of our own strength. He's, his strength is made perfect in our weakness. 
Come on, somebody. Verse three. Now, Tobiah, the Ammonite, was beside him. And he says, whatever they build, if even a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Whatever they try to build, if a fox go on it, he'll break it down. Mm, let's see what God has to say. Verse four, hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their approach on their own heads, the power of prayer, and give them as plunder to a land of captivity. Just like we was given up because of our disobedience, because we were given up to captivity, listen to this prayer. Hear, O oh, our God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads and give them as plunder to a land of captivity. What is he saying? Take care of my enemies for me, O oh God. Fight the battle for me, O oh God. I do not have the strength to fight it myself. That is what he's saying. Verse five, do not cover their iniquity and do not let their sin be blotted out from before you. For they have provoked you to anger before the builders. Mm. You gave the vision to rebuild the wall and they're mocking saying that is not possible. And there's not a God big enough to do it. Their God is not mighty enough to perform this. So they're mocking you, God. Show them what you're working with. <laughs> That's what they're saying. Verse six. So now Nehemiah is still speaking now himself. So we built the wall and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height. For the people had a mind to work. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites, all these ites, 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 heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed, that they became very angry. So the surrounding nations heard that the wall is coming up. The wall is actually being rebuilt, of which y'all doubted that it could never happen. And you see that the gaping holes, the gaps, were beginning to be closed. They became angry. Verse 8. And all of them conspired together to come together and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Now, they told on themselves, and I hope you caught it. If they truly believed... <laughs> that the nation was so feeble and so weak and could be conquered so easily, why did every nation not attack them themselves? Why did they have to band together all these nations to come against one feeble, weak nation with an unprotected city with open gates and gashes with gaps in their walls. Did you catch that? Because they know that history says that they serve a mighty God and this God fights their battles for them. Come on, somebody. So no matter what they mouth said, they heart told them something different. Are you following me? And this text, sometimes you have to look at the text and decipher what's really going on in your historical data, okay? So they banded together and conspired to attack Jerusalem. Verse 9, nevertheless, we, children of Israel, children of Jerusalem, the Jews, made our prayer to our God. Mm. And because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. The Bible says watch and pray. <clears throat> and that's what they did. 
He says, we made our prayer and we set watch against them day and night. They never let their guard down. Verse 10, then Judah said, the tribe of Judah, the strength of the laborers is failing. And there is so much rubbish that we are not able to build a wall. And our adversary said, they will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. So the purpose of them wanting to attack the city was to call a works cause a work stoppage. Because if they built this wall, then Jerusalem would be protected. <clears throat> Amen? Amen. And they're saying that they would sneak in. They would, because of the tall mounds of rubbish, I hope you caught that, that they're saying they would be able to sneak in and surprise them before they ever knew it. See, that's what they're saying. They would neither know or nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. All right, verse 12. So it was when the Jews who dwelt near them came that they told us 10 times from whatever place you turn, they will be upon us. Mm. Therefore, I position, Nehemiah, I position men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings, and I set the people according to their families. The 12 tribes of Jerusalem were always working in unison with each other, with, but they were always assigned in groupings, and the groupings were their tribes or their lineage, okay? You see that over and over again, and that's order. God will always be a God of order. He always set them in order, okay? Therefore, I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings, and I set the people according to their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows, verse 14. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders, and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, oh my God, and fight for your families, your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. You are not in captivity anymore. God told us to return back to our land. He told us he would be with us he told us to rebuild this wall. So we have no worries as long as we're doing what God told us to do. Come on, somebody. As long as God gives you an assignment and you are sure of that assignment and he orders your steps and directs your paths, you walk in that. Step by step, faith by faith, you walk in that because you will always be protected every step of the way, as long as you are doing what God told you to do. Come on. Remember that. Remember that. Verse 15, and it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had brought their plot to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall, everyone to his work. So it was from that time on, that half of my servants worked at construction while the other half held the spears, the shields, the bows, and wore armor. And the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. Verse 17, those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand, they worked at construction and with the other hand, a weapon. <laughs> Every one of the builders had his own sword girded at his side as he built. And the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And listen to Nehemiah. Then I said, so what is he saying? He's saying we were always ready. Now, don't get it twisted. We trust and believe that God fights our battles. But he didn't say be a fool either. 
Faith without works is dead, okay? Prepare yourself, defend yourself, stand on your faith, but know what is around you, okay? You pray, God's hand of protection to always be upon you and your family, but you still keep yourself protected at all times, okay? And what happened here, look at the context, what happened here? The plot or conspiracy was exposed to the people of their enemies while they were still yet unprotected. So they were made aware to protect themselves. And when the other nation saw that they were ready and protecting themselves, that's when they got scared, okay? That's when they got scared. So Nehemiah divided them in two. Half, you do construction. But listen to what he said. Half of you do construction. The other half protect the city. But for the ones that are doing construction, build with one hand and protect with the other hand. <laughs> you, build, you build with one hand and keep a sword or a spear in the other hand. You see what he is saying? You always be ready, but we are leaning and depending on God's favor, God's protection, and he will ultimately fight our battles for us. But be ready, be prepared, be ready. Amen. 18, every one of the builders had his sword girded up um, his side as he built, and the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. Verse 19, then I said to the nobles, the rulers, and the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive, and we are separated far from one another on the wall, okay? Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. So you see that answer's when he said at the end of verse 18, he says, and the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. So what is he saying? Nehemiah was so wise by God giving him the wisdom to complete the task or the assignment along with the provision for the vision that he gave him. <clears throat> he says, what I'm going to do is, <clears throat> since we're so spread out, excuse me, since we're so spread out, they didn't have cell phones, pages, and beepers, okay? So he had a trumpet player. I'm a trumpet player, by the way. <laughs> he had a trumpet player at each section. And at any time that that trumpeter were to blow that trumpet and they heard that sound, Everyone was to stop what they were doing and come and protect that area of the city because that's where they were being attacked, okay? So that was the plan, okay? That was the plan that Nehemiah had put in place. Well, verse 20, wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. But we have to put our faith into action because faith without works is dead, okay? 21, so we labored in the work and half of the men held the spears from daybreak until the stars appeared. Oh, they had their schedule together. At the same time, I also said to the people, let each man and his servants stay at night in Jerusalem and they may be our guard by night and a working party by day. So neither, verse 23, so neither I, my brethren, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me took off our clothes. Do you see how serious this is? Except that everyone took them off for washing. You took your clothes off to wash them, you put them back on, and you stayed ready. <laughs> Nehemiah had these people ready. They were prepared to defend the city. But remember, he says at the end of verse 20, our God will fight for us. 
but you still see all of the planning and preparation that was put into putting their faith into action, knowing they will remember now, they're looking at themselves. And that's what we do. We look at ourselves. We cannot complete this in and of ourselves. We cannot accomplish this goal. We cannot go against so many other people. And one person cannot make such a big difference. We look at ourselves like that. Come on, somebody. That's the example of the text. Look at what the text is saying. But with if nothing is possible by ourselves, but with God, all things are possible. We can do nothing of ourselves, but with the Holy Spirit within us, we can do all things, okay? We can do all things because of Christ, because of the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us. So God does it for us, and we walk in our faith, okay? That's your example. That's the example of the text. God will fight our battle for us. But we're preparing, we got our shields, we got our swords, we're going to war. They want a war, we're going to give it to them. We're going to war, but we already, we already claim the victory while we are preparing with our shields and swords, and nobody has even come to the wall yet. <laughs> they already have the victory already because the victory is in God. Do you hear me? But they put foot to ground. They put faith in action. They prepared themselves and continued the work while they were preparing. They continued to do what God told them to do, what he assigned them to do, all while knowing that the opposition, or these kids say now they're ops, the opposition was laying wait to attack them at any time. But it says, our God will fight for us at the end of 20. Oh, my God. So verse 23 ends chapter 4 by saying, So neither I, my brother, and my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me took off our clothes, except for to wash them and put them back on. And, hey, there's one of my favorite sayings that I say all the time, and I got to say it right now. You, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. Come on, somebody. And that's the thing. You stay prepared with the word of God. You don't have to get ready, okay? You hide that word in your heart so that I may not sin against thee. Keep that word in you. Stay ready. You don't have to get ready. And that's what Nehemiah was telling them. We stand ready. Come on, somebody. Come on. All right, chapter, chapter five. Let's move. We got to get chapter five in. Our goal is five and six, but let's get into five. It says... Nehemiah deals with the ops. <laughs> That's what the kids say. Nehemiah deals with oppression. Oppression. Okay. Chapter five. And there was a great outcry of the people and their wives against, oh, their Jewish brethren. Did I just say that right? Did I just read that? Did verse one say what I think it said? Yes, it did, because I told you last week what was going to happen. There was a great outcry of the people, the Jewish people, and their wives, the Jewish wives, against their, their own people, their Jewish brethren, their cousins, their uncles, their brothers, their sisters, their family. Verse 2. For there were those who said, we, our sons and our daughters are many. Therefore, let us get grain that we may eat and live. There were also some who said, we have mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses that we may buy grain because of the famine. Don't forget, they had just come out of captivity. They were slaves in captivity. Don't forget, that's why God wants us to teach the Bible book by book, chapter by chapter, line by line, not one verse at a time, pull one verse out of a whole book and think you're doing a Bible study. No. What's the context? The context is they just came out of captivity. 
the first big wave came out when we studied Ezra and Esther. Well, Esther, Ezra, they came out first, then Esther. Different waves came out of um, captivity, okay? <clears throat> Not all at once. They started to build a wall, then they stopped, okay, and restarted. So they needed help. They needed help, okay? They weren't rich right now, okay? They had needs. There were also some, verse, th verse three, we have mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses that we may buy grain against, I mean, um, because of the famine. I'll explain that in a second. Uh, verse four, there were also those who says, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our lands and vineyards. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. And indeed, we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters have been brought into slavery. It is not in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and vineyards. What are they saying? If you've been with me, if you have been studying your Bible correctly, in context, not one verse at a time, but in context, you know that the modern custom of the day was the bartering system. Uh, if you need it, it was to be supplied, but you had to barter your crops for, you know, maybe um, your cattle for crops or, or um, your cattle for food or, or um, one particular item for another item, or you signed away your land, um, you signed away your land for X amount of uh, whatever X amount of food and grain um, or water or whatever it was. Um, if you had children, they could work off your debt. So it was, they were called slaves in that um, regard. Whoever you borrowed money from, they were to work off that debt, their sons, their daughters. Some, if that, if it went to another level, the whole family uh, were living on land that used to belong to them, but now it does not belong to them because they had to sign it over um, because they were in debt, okay? It was collateral for their debt if there was a famine or they did not have any food or anything like that, okay? You remember we went over all that before, so you already know that. So let's keep moving. Verse six, and I, who is I, Nehemiah, I became very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. After serious thought, I rebuked the nobles and rulers and said to them, each of you is exacting usury, a fee to use, from his brother. So I called a great assembly against them. Now remember, first they had opposition from all the other nations. Now the opposition is coming from within. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? Sometimes your haters are outside your family. Sometimes your haters are outside your friends. Sometimes your haters is outside your inner circle. Sometimes they're inside. Sometimes you got to deal with the people closest to you. One of my other favorite sayings, only the people close to me can hit me because they're in arm's reach of me. The ones that are not in arm's reach of me can hit me, I don't care about them. I only care about if you get close enough to me that you can swing and cause some damage. Come on, somebody. It's a simple analogy, okay? So he's speaking of now the problem is not from without. It is from within, okay? So he said, each of you is exacting usury from his brother. So I call a great assembly against them. And I said to them, according to our ability, we have redeemed our Jewish brethren who were sold to the nations. Now, indeed, will you even sell your brethren? We were being sold. Now you're turning around, allowing your own cousins and aunts and uncles and distant cousins, your family, your brethren, 
we were slaves before, now you want them to be slaves to you? Really? Or should they be sold to us? Then they were silenced and found nothing to say. They were ashamed. We came out of slavery to enslave each other. What is he saying, people? If we are of the same kind, come on, African-Americans. If we are of the same kind, we should not condemn each other. We should not cause tax to each other, what they're saying. We should help one another and not cause any harm to one another. Am I being racist? Am I being different? Am I being a separatist? No. You have so many other nations do the exact same thing. So why can we not do it? Because we are the nation that is living under the curse that you have read about in Deuteronomy 28 that I have taught you back in Deuteronomy. So because of the curse is why we act like crabs in a barrel and we fight against one another, okay? Don't get it twisted. Other nations are not under that curse. We are. That's why we're in the predicament that we're in. Moving right along. We should help each other and not tear each other down, is what it's saying. So, according to our ability, we need, uh, we have redeemed our Jewish brethren who were sold into nations. Now, indeed, since we have been redeemed from captivity, will you even sell your brethren or should they be sold to us? Then they were silenced and found nothing to say. Verse 9. Then I said, what are you, what you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies? I also, with my brethren and my servants, am lending them money and grain. I'm giving them my money and my food so that my brothers can eat. Please let us stop this usury, this tax on each other. Um, paying a tax or paying funds to use whatever, okay? Verse 11, restore now to them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive groves, and their houses, also a hundredth of the money and the grain, the new wine <laughs> and the oil that you have charged them. Return it back to them. They need it. Don't take from them in time of need. Help each other. If one is wealthy in a nation, another should not be homeless or poor or without food or starving or needing clothing. If one is, if one is wealthy in a nation and another beside him is without, then you should always lift a hand of assistance. Period, point blank. That's the godly way to do it. So it says, restore now to them, their lands, their vineyards, and guess what? Not only the vineyards and, the, and all of this, but anything that you prospered from their land, the new wine and the new oil, any new oil that was pressed off of their land, give it, give it to them. Any new wine that you took their grapes when you accepted their land for collateral, for them to work off their debt, give them that new wine as well. Mm. So the only thing you were able to keep is what you already used up. You benefited from the land and anything that they gave you while you had it in your possession. Now, enough is enough, give it back to them. Now, what normally happens, this is where you hear, young folk, I don't have time to explain it, but this is what you hear like the year of Jubilee, like the, the year of restoration. Anything that's been giving away or have been taking away or have been lost um, or sold, then it, it comes back to you that seventh year. Um, and it's another principle of, of sowing and reaping. And it is, it is uh, all the crops the land that you, you have to give the land a rest and then it rebounds and things like that, okay? All I don't have time to explain that, but that's, that's also what it deals with. Okay, so that's what was going on, but they said, no, stop it. Give it back to them right now. Give it back to them. 
verse 12. So they said, we will restore it and will require nothing from them. We will do as you say, Nehemiah. You see that? Then I called the priests and required an oath from them that they would do according to this promise. Then I shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake out each man from his house and from his property who does not perform this promise. Even thus, may he be shaking out and empty. And all the assembly said, amen, and praise the Lord. Then the people did according to this promise. Now it, it goes over Nehemiah's generosity. Verse 14, moreover, from, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year to the uh, 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, 12 years, neither I nor my brethren ate the governor's provisions. But the former governors who were before me laid burdens on the people and took from them bread and wine, besides 40 shekels of silver. Yes, even their servants bore rule over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. Indeed, I also continued to work on this wall, and we did not buy any land. All the servants were gathered there for the work. And at my table were 150 Jews and rulers, besides those who came to us from the nations around us. Now that which was prepared daily was one ox and six choice sheep, as fowl were prepared for me, and once every 10 days, an abundance of all kinds of wine. Yet in spite of this, I did not demand the governor's provisions because the bondage was heavy on this people. We have to understand this. If, if yes, 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 pastors, preachers, teachers, yes, um, what you receive is honorable. The honorarium is honorable, yes. But there are also times when it should not be accepted or should not be asked for. I'm in a very situation right now. I ask a dollar for a preacher every Sunday, period. Do not receive any of that because it's not able to be done. The gospel is free. Do not put a tax on the people that they cannot pay or that will put them in burden to pay. You don't do that. So he's saying, no matter what, I never ask them anything. I never ask for anything, but guess what? Who was called? to bless the people, who was called to yield the people, to, to lead the people. The one person who can go back and say, I didn't do it for the money. Oh my God. Y'all missed that altogether. Who did God call Nehemiah out of all of these people, the children of Israel, to lead this great endeavor to rebuild this wall and to lead the children to rebuild their strength and the strength of the wall the physical and the personal, to rebuild, who did he call? He called the one that wasn't focused on what he would get in return. He did it because of his fear, because of the fear of the Lord God, he said. He did it out of his love for God and his respect for God. That's who was called to lead the people. Yet in spite of this, I did not demand the governor's provisions because the bondage was heavy on this people. Remember me, my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. He stood on what he had done. You see that? He stood on that. Let's get into chapter six. It's real short. Then you see, I, I have eight minutes. Conspiracy against Nehemiah. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, and all the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that they were that there were no breaks left in the wall now. Though, and it says parenthetically, though at that time I had not hung the doors and the gates. I love it how the Bible gives you so many details. It said they heard that we rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left in it, even though I had not hung the doors on a certain part of the gates. That San, that San Ballot, um sent to me saying, come. Let us meet together among the villages in the plain, but they thought to do me harm. How did he know that? 
because the spirit of God spoke to him and said, it is not for your benefit. Do not go. They tend to mean you harm. Why? Did you miss what they did? The enemies heard that the wall was rebuilt. There were no breaks in it. So what did they do? Come, come here, come here, come outside the city, come outside the gate. Let us go meet among the villages in the plain. Did you catch that? I want you to be stupid enough that God assists you to rebuild this wall, to fortify your city, but I expect you to be, since, since I can't come against you in might, in war, now what I'm gonna do is I know you're not as smart as me, so intellectually, I'm going to convince you or trick you, come outside the city, let us talk. Let us sit down and have a great talk uh, in the villages in the plain. Don't ever step outside your God's hand of protection. Mm. Don't ever step outside of God's hand of protection. Well, how do I step outside? Falling out of his word, his will, and his way. Be obedient, and you are always protected. Sin separates us from God, not God from us. He's always there. He's always looking to extend grace and mercy unto you. Always. But sin makes us feel like that we're separated from God. Always be in God's favor and you are always protected. Verse three, so I sent messages to them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. I'm busy over here. I'm too busy doing this. I know I've been attacked before and it's like, I'm, 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 I'm focused on kingdom building. I don't have time to be focused on that petty stuff you're talking about on that side of the city. I'm on this side of the city trying to focus on preaching the gospel, teaching, counseling, and building God's kingdom. That's, that's the mindset you have to have. You don't have time for pettiness. You don't have time to get off track. Stay focused on the vision that God has given you. You get outside that will and you get outside that vision, you're going to get outside of God's protection. Stay where you belong. Stay where he told you to be. Somebody needed that. Stay where he told you to be. Work on your assignment. Don't worry about what everybody else is doing. Focus on your assignment. So I sent messages to them saying, I'm doing a great work. I don't have time for y'all over there. I'm sorry I didn't say that. It says, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down, down to you? Why should I stop working for the Lord to worry about what a hater got to say? Mm. Did you catch that? Verse four, but they sent me this message four times. And I answered them in the same manner. Then Sanballat sent his servant, get that off there, sent his servant to me as before, the fifth time, with an open letter in his hand. In it was written this It is reported among the nations that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding a wall that you may be their king. Mm. Now the lies start. When they can't get to you physically, when they can't trick you intellectually, then they try to defame you. Oh my God. Then they try to lie on you and destroy your character. Come on, here you go. Verse seven, and you have also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem saying there is a king in Judah. Now these matters will be reported to the king. So come therefore, and let us consult together, because I got dirt on you now. Then I sent to him saying, no such things as you say are being done, but you invent them in your own heart. <laughs> Verse nine, for they all were trying to make us afraid, saying these, their hands will be weakened in the work and it will not be done. We're not stopping the vision of what God has given us, we're too busy over here to worry about you, okay? Now, therefore, oh God, strengthen my hands. <laughs> Allow me to keep working 
despite the attack that the enemy comes against me. <laughs> Allow me to keep working. Allow me to keep my eyes focused on the prize. Allow me to keep um, with the standing behind this plow of the gospel and continue to teach and preach this gospel. Oh my God, I made it by myself instead of about the text, but I'm applying it to myself. You better apply it to yourself. Allow me to continue the work when all these people are coming against me is what Nehemiah is saying. Verse 10, afterwards, I came to the house. Uh, <coughs> Who was in, uh, but get this, get this, get this. I'm sorry, I got to stop this. Afterwards, I came to the house. Do you see what it said? It says the son of Deliah, Shemaiah, who was a what? <laughs> I'm, la I'm laughing so hard I can't get it out. I'm sorry. It says, who was a secret informer. And he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us close the doors of the temple for they are coming to kill you. Indeed, at night, they will come to kill you. Did the Bible just say a secret informer? <laughs> yes, it did. He said, let's have a first 48 moment. When I get in this little room, let's, let's get in the temple and let's, let's go behind closed doors and let me inform you or let me rat, as we say, let me tell it all. Let me tell you exactly what's about to happen. Let me rat on the people that I'm informing <laughs> on. <laughs> That's hilarious to me. You have to get joy in reading this Bible. You think these things in the world today just pop up? No. Any and everything you deal with today is in the Bible. You didn't know a secret informant was in the Bible either, did you? <laughs> but now you do. Verse 11, and I said, should such a man as I run? Should such a man as I flee? And who is there such as I who would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Mm. Then I perceived that God had not sent him at all but that he pronounced this prophecy, false prophecy, against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He was paid to say whatever prophecy he was supposed to say. Cut your TV channel on. You see a lot of people giving false prophecy for, because they paid to do so. For this reason, he was hired, that I should be afraid and act that way in sin, so that they may have cause for an evil report that they may reproach me. They trying to get the man of God off track by lying to him so they could have something to say against him by sending, sending false prophecy and an informant. <laughs> the ops was coming to get him. <laughs> the opposition was coming. 14, my God, listen to this, my God, remember Tobiah and Sanballat according to these, their works, he already said, remember my works, okay? He already said, remember, I didn't charge anybody. I didn't focus on money. I didn't um, hurt your people. I uplifted your people and blessed them and helped them and gave to them. In and of myself, I gave to them of myself. Remember what I did. Now he's saying, my God, remember what they did. According to their works and the prophetess, and the rest of the prophets who would have made me afraid. Remember what they did. Verse 15, it says the wall completed. So the wall was finished on the 25th day uh, in 52 days. And it happened when all our enemies heard of it and all the nations around us saw these things that they were very disheartened in their own eyes for they perceived that this work was done by our God. Mm. Right before their eyes, the power and majesty and might of God was displayed by building this wall. Remember how long and extensive this wall was. Remember they had to blow trumpets just to hear each other from miles away. 
and they got this thing rebuilt in 52 days. Remember that. That's the awesomeness of God. His ways are not our ways. His timing is not our timing. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He can do in the blink of an eye what you cannot do in a lifetime. Come on, somebody. Lean and depend on his power and his might, not your own. Verse 17. Also in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and the letters of Tobiah came to them. For many in Judah were pledged to him because he was the son-in-law um, of the son of Arach. Um, then also they reported his good deeds before me and reported my words to him. Tobiah sent letters to frighten me. So he continued to send letters to frighten him that went on deaf ears because what? Nehemiah was flowing in the vision that God had given him. And he was assigned to go back to the people and lead them to rebuild this wall so that the city could be protected. Amen? Amen. My brother, my sister, that concludes session 129. Uh, as I like to say, if you made it this long, if you're listening in by YouTube and you made it in this long, subscribe, like, share. It means the world to the ministry. Uh, you would never be uh, asked for a dime for this ministry. But if you subscribe, like, and share, what you will do will assist the ministry in pushing out this gospel to other people. Um, YouTube will then, it's just a mathematical algorithm. If you subscribe, they will think someone else will subscribe and they will send it to them. So do your part to bless us. If you've been blessed by this word, subscribe, like, share, hit the notifications bell so you'll be prompted when we post new videos. Um, God bless you for coming on by YouTube. God bless you for coming on by the radio blog ministry. Continue to come on every Wednesday, um, midday, every Wednesday, no matter where you are around the world. Um, our Zoom line, please continue to come on um, Thursday at seven o'clock our time. Uh, please continue to come on. May God bless you. May God bless you. And may God bless you. Tell someone else about the line. Tell someone else about the ministry. And as I always say in closing, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May this word grow a seed in your spirit and manifest in your heart. May your love of God grow through your knowledge of God's word. Amen. That concludes Back to Basics Bible Study Session 129. May God bless you and keep you as my prayer. See you next week as we dive into God's word. Amen. Amen.